song to our God we lift up one voice singing alleluia second verse again we sing chains have been broken and the army is starting to rise up the season of awakening yes. chains have been broken chains have been broken eyes have been opened army of dry bones starting to rise death is defeated we are victorious you are alive see chains have been broken chains have been broken eyes have been opened army of dry bones is starting to rise Singing 
hallelujah. To our God we lift up one voice. To our God we lift up one song. To our God we lift up one voice. Singing hallelujah. To our God, sing hallelujah, Jesus' blood in righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. We sing that again. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less. Jesus' blood in righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. Let's sing Christ alone. Let's sing it out. Christ alone.
center, Lord. You're the center of it all. No matter what we're going through, Lord, you are the cornerstone, you are the center. Mm. We can trust, we can have hope. you up this morning. We worship you, Lord.
fight in our lives In our lives be glorified In our lives be lifted high Jesus in my life as we worship him in his presence we're transformed we are changed as we lift him up we become what we behold so we look to you and be glorified be glorified in our lives be glorified in what we say and what we do for your glory for your glory we love you jesus we love you jesus we just sing i love you lord I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy my king in what you hear let it be a sweet sweet sound in your ear amen thank you Hey, good morning, everyone. How are you doing today? Are you good? Fantastic. It's great to be with you. This is our last session here uh, on this trip. I have some things I want to share with you, but uh, I don't want to assume that, um, that everyone here was at our meetings the last couple of nights. How many of you were not at the meetings uh, last night or the night before? Oh, yeah, quite a few of you. Okay. So let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Because some of you, by the looks of it, were not even alive in 1997. <laughs> the last time I was here. I can't believe it. 97. Like, that's just like... Uh. So you're wondering, how old is this guy? I was 10 years old when I came here. <laughs> Do you believe that? I've been married 30 years. Um, last September, to the same woman, 30 years. And people always look at me and they go, you know, as soon as you say that, people start looking at you funny. They go, because they want to know, how old is this guy? Right? So I always tell them, you know, I married Debbie when I was 12. And, you know, some people that are not too sharp actually believe that. 
But, um, but no, I've been married 30 years. I have three awesome children. I have a 27-year-old son who is uh, about to be engaged to an amazing, amazing uh, young, young lady. I have a 25-year-old daughter that's eligible. Um, and guys, she's a model. She does modeling. She's gorgeous. And I have an 18-year-old daughter um, who, in her next, on her next birthday, she'll be 35. <laughs> oh, I love my kids. Um, yeah, I talked to my son this morning. We had a very unusual thing that happened. At 3 o'clock in the morning, how many of you know you're not usually checking Facebook at 3 in the morning, right? Unless, you know, you, you got some issues. And um, so I wake up at 7. I looked at my phone, and I saw that I'd missed 19 messages from my wife. And I went, oh, no, oh, no, what's going on? So I read through the messages. Last night, between midnight and 3 o'clock in the morning, our entire sewage system in our basement backed up and flooded our entire basement. Yeah. Yeah, see, at this time, I'm supposed to go rah, 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 the enemy's fighting me, and I'm going to get back at him. No, 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 I'm just like, yeah, I'm not happy about that at all. You know, like $900 bass guitar and all kinds of amps and stuff like that down there. But you know what? I also thought to myself, perhaps this is some retaliation to some of the things that we were talking about and sharing over the last couple of days. So, um, you know, I'm with that too, you know. But um, very interesting stuff that's, that's, that's happening. We've been sharing over the last couple of days uh, really some biblical and godly concepts of being kings and priests, of taking authority, stepping into what God has for you. And that coupled with the message that I've been sharing regarding what our role is as the church, that we are not called to do church, we are called to be the church. And what's the difference between doing church and being church? Well, the, the reality is this, guys. I don't know about you, but I've met so many people who love Jesus. I mean, genuinely, they love the Lord. They love him. But they have no, they have no place in their lives for church anymore. Anyone meet anybody like that? I've met them by the multitudes. And there's everything in me that wants to try to convince them that they need to reconnect with that particular church or that particular church. Because I've traveled 24 different countries around the world, so I meet people all over the world, right? Guess what, guys? I've been to Finland eight times. Yeah. So I know you Finns really, really well. And, and, you know, so I've met people from all over the place, and they're, 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 so their church settings are different, but their stories are all the same. And I don't want to just be the bearer of bad news, but I want to be real with you. There are people all over the world who love Jesus, who no longer have any room in their lives for church. And what my conclusion is, is I don't blame them. Why would you say such a terrible thing, Curtis? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. Because for a lot of us, church is about going through motions and stuff as opposed to what the reality of what church should be really is. And, 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 and these people are tired of, of doing church. And what they really want is to be the church. So what is does it mean to be the church? What is it all about, really? Am I going to be able to summarize what the purpose of the church is in the next half an hour to satisfy everybody in this room and those who are not here? No, I don't think I'm going to be able to do that. But you know what? Church and the purposes of God for the church is very, very simple. Very simple. You know, folks, Christianity is a real simple deal. Very, very simple. God just wants everything in your life. That's, that's it. He just, he just wants everything. He wants your heart. He wants your emotions. He wants your mind. He wants your destiny. He wants it all. He wants to be Lord. 
But how many of you know, although it's very simple, it's not very easy. <laughs> Are you guys awake today? I just, just want to make sure. How many of you know that although it's very simple, Christianity is very simple, it's not very easy. The process of the Holy Spirit working in your life and in the life of a human being who submits themselves to God, that process is called sanctification. And that process is very simple. All you do is wake up every morning and say, Holy Spirit, here I am. I yield to you. Do with me what you will. <laughs> but it's not easy. <laughs> okay, maybe it is easy for you. It's not easy for me. Not easy. Thank you so much for being honest, sweetheart. You, thanks. I appreciate that. It's not easy. Why is it not easy? Because there's a lot of us involved in the process. Are you with me? There's a lot of our stuff involved in the process. Now let's translate that a little bit into the institution called church. A lot of what we do and call church has nothing to do with the kingdom of God. A lot of what we do call church, and please don't hear me as the one coming from the perfect church. Listen, guys, our church is not perfect. No church is perfect. I'm not coming from the Toronto church that, you know, because we have revival, everything's perfect. Good heavens. That's not the truth at all. It's not about that. I'm not the perfect pastor. I'm not the perfect evangelist, and I don't attend the perfect church. That's what we were talking about. But what we are talking about is having hearts that are willing to submit to the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our churches. Because here's the deal, guys. Here's the deal. God is only going to bless what he's doing, not what we're doing. Here's our mission. It's very simple, but it's not easy. Our mission is to love one another and to reach the world. That's it. Sermon's over, folks. Thank you. It's great to be here. <laughs> so, so how do we get that all muddled up? We get that all muddled up because we have layers upon layers upon layers of our own uh, establishing our own order and our own desires and our own impressions and interpretations of what God should and shouldn't do. We call that tradition. And we layer it and we layer it and we layer it. Then we add boards and we add more boards. We add committees and we add more committees. Guys, you know what? I want to tell you something. God never speaks to a committee. Never. He never has and he never will. God never speaks to a group. Oh, no, now I'm really in trouble. <laughs> Show me in the New Testament where he speaks to a group of people. You know what he does? He speaks to a person who then is confirmed by a group of people, elders, that it's God. Whereas in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. But you see, let me get back to this now, because we're going to go to the Bible so that I don't get accused of not preaching from the Bible. <laughs> so we layer things, don't we? We layer them, right? What do, and how, why do we do it? We do it to preserve, preserve our own things. Curtis, why are you hitting on this? I, I don't know. I don't know. I guess one of the things I pray all the time is God just speak through me. <laughs> I don't know. But I want to say this to you. I want to say this. We are in a city, we, you, are in a city where there are many, many souls that are desperately waiting for us, the church, to get out from under our nonsense and grab a hold of the, the, the mission of Jesus and reach them. Okay, now one of the things that I sense with coming into the city here is there's a lot of competition among churches here. There's a lot of stuff that's going on among leaders here. I, 
Uh, yeah, I've been, last time I was here was in 97, guys, so don't get mad at me, okay? But I want to address that. I want to address that by saying this. Church, let me be honest with you. If you think for a second that your mission is to bring unity among every single other believer in this city, I'm going to tell you, it ain't going to happen. So stop it. Stop it. We are called to love one another, but we can't do what only he can do. What our purpose is, what our purpose is, is to say, oh, Lord Jesus, let your kingdom come and your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Listen, my, my dear friends, listen, our purpose is to ask for the mandate of heaven. I'm not talking religion. That's why I spent time talking about this religion thing. Not religion. Not my mandate, your mandate, or the mandate of the 84, five-year history of this church. No, no, no. No, no, no. Our mission is to say, oh God, what is the mandate of heaven? What is it that you want, oh God? What is it that your word clearly tells us to do? And that is the mission that we want to bring into our city. That's the mission that we want to, as a church, be the point of the arrow into what God wants. Because that's where his blessing is. His blessing is in us accomplishing what the mandate of heaven is. I want you to think of it this way. God has a blueprint. God has a blueprint and what he's asking us to do. Listen, I don't care who you are in this place, whether you've been a Christian for 54 years or whether you're still dealing with substance abuse and you're still finding out how to love Jesus. Listen, God's mandate is the same for all of us. The disciples came to Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And what he told them to do is he said, first of all, say, Father. And then he said, and then pray this, pray this, the kingdom of God let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the, that's the blueprint of heaven. That's the mandate of heaven. That's the culture of heaven. I want to tell you, every one of our cultures must. God, God, God loves the nations. He created us all, didn't he? He made me black. He made you white. made him brown. He made somebody else. I don't know. He's, he's, he just loves the rainbow. He loves, he loves it. But I want to tell you, every single culture must have infused within it the culture of heaven. It must not be about our culture overlapping God's, God's culture. It's not about that. It's about his culture. And what is culture? It's the, it's the, it's the sum total of values and, 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 um, and it's the sum total of, it's a behavior of heaven. It's, that's what a culture is. A culture is behavior. I want to ask you, as I ask myself, are we living the culture of heaven? Because that's the only culture that God will, will, will bless. Do you understand what I'm saying? Please don't hear me wrong. I'm not trying to insult anybody. I'm just saying that our purpose as a church is not to do church. It's to be the church. And what does the church do? What is the culture of heaven? Matthew chapter 25, Jesus said something really scary. You want to read it? One person wants to read it. Okay, I'll read it. Matthew 25, turn over there, please, very quickly. Very quickly, guys. This is exciting stuff. Well, what verse am I looking at? Uh, let's go over to verse 31. Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. This is not a parable, right? The difference between a parable and reality is a parable is a story to illustrate a truth, right? When Jesus was with, with farmers, he talked about farming. When he was a fisherman, he talked about fishing, right? I think a lot of, I think a lot of us preachers, we should, be, we should be preaching in parables like Jesus did. I should be doing that more to be honest, because it illustrates a truth, right? Well, this isn't a parable. Jesus is looking into the future and he's giving us, a, he's giving us, a, um, he's giving us an account of, what he, of what's gonna happen. 
Verse 32 says this, all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Verse 34 says, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom. Oh, that's beautiful. What is our inheritance? The kingdom prepared for us before the creation of the world. And then he says in verse 35, he says, because I'm so pleased that you maintained your elite status as religious people in society. Is that what he says? <laughs> Are you listening to me? I am so proud that you attended church every Sunday and you not, did not allow yourself to be stained by those filthy homosexuals in the city. Is that what he says? Listen, what he's telling us, what he's about to tell you and I is that our reward from Jesus, the kingdom, we get that reward, listen to me now very carefully, not because of what we do, not because of what we say, but because of what we've done. And what is it that we do that gives us that reward? We express the mission of the church. We live the culture of the kingdom. And what is that culture? Look at it. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. Folks, I want to tell you something. Listen. Well, let me finish reading. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Listen. God is not looking for us to build some superstructured building with multiple floors and intricate internet systems. He's not looking for us to get complicated. I believe that a lot of us, the reason why as the church we've lost our way is because we've forgotten the very simple elements of our faith. We've forgotten the things that please God. I think a lot of us in church are bored. We're just bored. We just do the thing, we do the tradition, we come, we do, we come, we do, and we think, we think that that's what it's about. I'm sorry if I'm sounding hard on you today. But listen, let me just tell you this right now. When you feed the poor, clothe those who need clothing, visit the sick, give water to the thirsty, when you do that, you are expressing the kingdom culture that will bring a reward to you and I. That's what he's after, folks. How are we going to transform the world? By standing up here and shouting and screaming about this prophetic declaration. <sighs> Please don't hear me wrong. It's important to do that. But I want to tell you, rah, 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 isn't producing anything. Stop it. It's nonsense. It's one thing to rah, 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 but you know what? I hope that when we scream, we also go. Because that's what matters. We don't get a reward. I will not get my reward. Listen, guys, I want to tell you something. Do you know many of us preachers? We've already received our reward in full. I'm telling you. We, we've are, many of us have already received our reward. Because we've gotten the accolades of men. Oh, Curtis, you're so anointed. Oh, this is so wonderful. Oh, you have changed. All of that, I tell you, I want to deflect that as much as possible because many of us have already received our reward because we've gotten it from people. Oh, dear. Folks, listen. It's not what it's about. 
You know what it's about? It's about you guys going and, and, and feeding people. That's what it's about. It's about helping those who can't help themselves. It's about doing that and earning that right for us to preach the gospel. It's, it's, it's about loving people with nothing in the expectation of any return. Because here's the deal. Here's the deal. I want you to look at this. Look at how the righteous respond to Jesus. What do they say? Lord, we didn't see you hungry and feed you. We didn't see you naked and needing, needing clothes. We didn't see you thirsty. Why would they say that? Because it was done out of a heart of love, not one that's looking for recognition. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we do what we do from the motivation that we want to see God's mandate, the, 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 the blueprint of heaven come to earth. And that blueprint of heaven to earth is the manifestation of God's love towards people. Because that's what he cares about. He doesn't care about anything else. Folks, God doesn't care about buildings. He doesn't care about plots of land. He doesn't... Oh, dear Jesus. He didn't send his son to die a horrible death on the cross so that we could erect some building to the glory of God. That's not possible. I'm telling you, it's not possible. Heaven is my throne. The earth is where I rest my feet. Where's the house you will build for me, he says in Isaiah 66. Basically he's saying, I'm so big, you can't contain me. But he says, but this is the one that I look to. Read it. It's on page 817. He says, but this is the one that I look to. The one who is humble in their heart and broken before me. Do you folks see? That it's so easy for us to miss the kingdom of heaven. It's so easy for us to miss it. A bunch of children came around Jesus, right? Remember that? And they were like, oh, Jesus, ah! They're pulling on him and pulling his, his robe and everything and putting snot on him. <laughs> and what did the disciples say? Get away from him. Shh, get away, get away, get away. Let's not have the sacred defiled. What did Jesus say? Leave them alone. <laughs> Leave them alone. Let them come. <laughs> Listen, if you're like a child, you have the invitation of Jesus. You may not have the invitation of religion, you may not have the invitation of institution, but you have the invitation of God. Because that's who he is. He doesn't say dress up, clean up, and come to me. Oh, Jesus, forgive us. Folks, listen. Do you know what we've done? The church has said, if you behave yourself, then you can come and we'll have relationship with you. Jesus says... Don't worry about how you behave. Come to me. And I will change your behavior. He says, leave him alone. Let him come. Because the whole kingdom of heaven is made up of such as these. As a matter of fact, he said this. He said, you won't even enter into the kingdom unless you become like one of them. Are you hearing me? The entrance to the kingdom of heaven is not PhDs and doctorates. It's not great behavior. It's not polished appearance and the ability to speak in a religious tone of voice. The entrance to the kingdom of heaven is being like a child. Aren't you glad? Because none of us here could live up to that stuff. Do you know what the problem is with the Ten Commandments? The law? We are just, we are lawyers by nature. 
We are, we are, as human beings, we are lawyers by nature. Man, I tell you, I am so, I can be so religious sometimes. I sit in a certain spot at church every Sunday. I sit on the front row. I'm one of the pastors. I sit in the front row. That's my spot, for goodness sakes. Don't you dare. And you don't realize it until somebody sits there. You know what I mean? Are you with me here? You don't realize it until someone sits there, and you're like, what the? And you go, wait, 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 wait a minute. Who cares? Right? We're, we, are so, we are so legalistic by nature. It's incredible. It's the thing that we're always trying to, we always have to keep pushing against and pushing against and pushing against. See, the problem with the Ten Commandments was that it never empowered people to obey them. And that was the whole book of Galatians, isn't it? The problem with legalism, the problem with the law, is that the Ten Commandments was enforced by angels and by God himself. The whole mountain shook and brrrr. You want to talk about Thunder Bay, but it's a Thunder Mountain. And the whole thing was full of smoke and fire, and he did it on purpose to scare the heck out of them. Right? He did it on purpose, and Moses walked into the thick blackness and heard the voice of God, and the people said, don't let him speak to us or we're going to die. I mean, it was just a scary, scary deal. And God did it in order to show them the weight of how important it is to obey those commandments. But none of them could obey them. That's why the Bible says that it was a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. So it's like a speed limit sign, 100 kilometers an hour. 100 kilometers an hour. I don't know about you, but I never obey that thing. <laughs> oh, come on. Neither do you. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> the problem with speed limit signs is they never empower you to obey them. They're always telling you what you're doing is wrong. That's the law. That's, 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 the legal, that's legalism. That's how it works. Right? Jesus comes along and says, no, 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 no. I'm going to, by my spirit coming to live inside of you, you are going to be able to live and express and obey those commandments, not because you are trying hard to, but because you are allowing my spirit through you to work obedience in your life. Why am I saying that? Because... We can either decide to do church, and if we do, we're comfortably flowing in legalism, comfortably. Or we can decide to be the church. And how do we do that? Oh, just love people, folks. <sighs> just decide. Just decide that whatever you do, you're just going to love. That's it. It's, it's not, I told you, it's not, it's not, it's not rocket science. It, it's not rocket science. As George Bush says, it's not rocket surgery. It's, it's very, it's very simple. It's just not easy. Lord, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus goes on to tell us in Matthew 25, he says, as the righteous say, when did we see you? Hungry, thirsty, needing something to, 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 being a stranger. When do we see you needing clothes? When do we see, and the king will reply. The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. <laughs> okay, let me just, let me just, let me just throw this at you. I want to pray that you and I, would see Jesus in every human being we lay eyes on. Wouldn't that change pretty much everything? Oh, Curtis, that's a heavy task, man. You don't understand. There's people I don't like. <laughs> There's people I don't like, too. I, I'm, I'm being honest with you. There's people I don't like, yeah. So what do we do? Do we pretend? No, we don't pretend. We ask for God's grace. We, for, we ask, we forgive. How many times are you going to, there's, listen guys, can I, can I let you know something? There is somebody in my life 
I do not, I do not like this individual. Every time I see them, my hands just kind of go like this. Like, I'm being honest. Oh, how could you say that? Because I don't like to lie. I don't like them. And how can I see Jesus in that person? Well, I forgive them. Sometimes... 15, 20, 25 times a day. Remember when the, how many times are we supposed to forgive someone? Jesus goes, well, you, maybe 70 times seven in a day. Could you imagine what the disciple thought after he said that? He walked away going, 490 times I've got to forgive James? <laughs> the answer is yes. Yeah, yeah. I want, to, I want to pray that we see Jesus in every single human being. Because here's what I said last night, and I'll say it again. I want you to know something, guys. I'm going to end soon. I want you to know something. God loves people more than anything. And there are people, there are people where his spirit is resting on them because Jesus said that the spirit of God would. He said the Holy Spirit has gone into the world to what? Convict the world with regards to their sin. I want you to know something, guys. God loves people way more than what we think our church does. There are people waking up every single morning. They're getting up today. Women that are waking up, rolling over, turning over, and looking at someone on the other side of the bed and going, I can't even remember how I got here. Not even that bad. There are businessmen who are worth millions and millions of dollars, and their conscience is killing them because they know that they're taking advantage of people. What do you think all that is? It's the Holy Spirit convicting them. Well, you were there, weren't you? I was there. Some of us have been saved so long we can't really remember what it was like. <laughs> you need to remember. You need to remember. Folks, I want to tell you, the world is not looking to go to hell. They're not trying to go to hell. They're not. The LGBTQ community is not looking to, to subvert our innocent, lovely children to their dastardly, demonic ways. That You're not that important. What they're looking for is an expression and a celebration of who they are. Is it right? Folks, come on. Do I have to tell you that? Yes or no? Any persecuted group looks to fight against their persecutors. What's going to be the difference? What's going to be the difference is that we live in the culture of the kingdom. You show me anywhere in the New Testament, anywhere in the Gospels, where Jesus ever stood on a soapbox and started shouting down the social ills and the social problems of his time. Show me, anywhere. But yet he revolutionized an entire culture. How did he do it? Because he brought a culture that had never been established before, the culture of the kingdom. Because he healed the sick. He forgave people who were, who were, who were a mess. Why do you think Mary of Magdala came to him and would wipe his, wipe, wipe his feet with her hair? Why? Was it because he condemned her? No, because she saw a different way. She saw, she saw hope when she saw Jesus. Why do you think she was the first one at the tomb? Because the one who loves the most gives the most. Curtis, they killed Jesus. Yeah, they did. 
only because they were threatened that their religious establishment would be overturned. Not because they loved him, but because they hated him. Are you with me? Church, this is who we are. This, this is who we are. Well, aren't we supposed to point out people's sin? What? Are you God? Isn't the gospel the gospel of, of righteousness? Are we not supposed to, to call people to account? Absolutely we do. Absolutely. Most definitely. I cannot tell you how many times I've said to people, you need to stop living that way now. But guess what? They listen because they know it to be true. Not because I bark at them. Oh, church, we've done too much barking, haven't we? We've done more talking than listening. All right, I'm going to end with this. I have, I have, a, um, I have the opportunity as a pastor of evangelism, and, and my role also is for all of our churches around the world to help our churches develop evangelism. So I, I have a, a, quite a bit of responsibility. It's, it's, it's kind of fun. It's scary. I, I can't do it, so it must be God. Um, and I've had the opportunity of having interns. And uh, last year I had three phenomenal interns, at, one of which, one's back in Costa Rica, and um, one moved from, um, from uh, New Brunswick to Mississauga, and, and, you know, she's like a spiritual daughter of ours. And, and, and our interns came out of, they were before, they were absolutely radical hell-bent militant lesbians. Like I'm talking militant. Like, you know, I hate the church. Why? I don't know, just because I think they hate me. That kind of thing. Because that's usually, that's usually where it comes from, guys, I'm telling you. So, so I sat down with them and I've asked them really, really hard questions. And I said, listen, explain to me. Explain to me. Did you feel right about living like that? Did you, did you feel right about it? You know what they say to me? Curtis, there isn't one of us that feels completely settled about living this way. So I said, so, so why, why does it seem as though the LGBTQ community is so angry all the time? Because, well, they are angry. Because the more society tries to push them into being what is normal, it's a more deeply entrenched and angry they get. So I said, so what, I said, I said to him, so what made the difference for you? Are you ready for this? Now, I got to be honest with you. They, they still struggle with same-sex attraction. And they probably always will. But they are not practicing the sin that they've been delivered from. Listen, folks, weakness isn't sin. Paul said, look at it, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and look at it in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The weaknesses, the weakness, Paul said, I glory in my weakness so that Christ's power will rest on me. Weaknesses are possibly the susceptibility towards those things. Are you following me? So I said, tell me something. How did you go from there to here? And they said to me, Curtis, we started going to church. And for a year, two years, nobody judged us. They just loved us. My one, one intern, she said, she said, every Sunday, people would just pray for me. I would go with my girlfriend, and people would just pray for me. Every single week, they'd just pray for me. And she said, and one day, 
He says, one day, the Holy Spirit just landed on me. Curtis, it was just, and nobody else was, nobody did anything. She said, I was just in church and the Holy Spirit just landed on me. And I just went, I don't need that identity anymore. And she's been free ever since. Isn't that incredible? Yes, Jesus! I know I'm going all over the place today, folks. But you know what? Um, can we make a decision that the mandate of heaven becomes our number one priority and becomes our vision? Can, can we do that? Amen. Father, we just worship you today and we thank you. We thank you that, <laughs> Lord, th thank you so much that you're not like me. <laughs> Lord, thank you so much that you're not like us. Father, your word says that when you come back, Jesus, the wheat will grow with the tares. And you said that. We can't take the tares out of the wheat. They're both going to grow together. But Lord, we ask you in our lives that you'd help us to follow you. Holy Spirit, I'm asking for every single person in this amazing church, I'm asking for every single one of us in this place, that you would give us eyes to see your presence resting on people. That as we go about our daily affairs, today, tomorrow, that you would show us your presence on people everywhere in this city, everywhere that we go. Lord, I'm asking for an incredible breaking out of salvation. Not because we scream, go, 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 revival's coming, but Lord, that we are containers and carriers of revival. And I wanna commission you today, church. I wanna commission you today from the greatest of us to the least of us, from the least of us to the greatest. I want to commission you today to leave this place and bring revival to people. As I said last night, the mothership's not going to land, guys. It's not going to happen that way. There's not going to be some giant spaceship landing over Thunder Bay and all of a sudden, oh my gosh, revival's broken out. No, 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 because that wouldn't be, that's not in the Bible. What is in the Bible is go and make disciples. So may the love of God so flow through us. I bless you in the name of Jesus, Father. I declare that. I decree that. I establish that with every ounce of faith I have for this church, for these people, for this city. That we would stand up, rise up, and love up like never before. Is there anybody here today and you have never really given your life to Jesus Christ? Anyone here today, just wave at me. If you say, Curtis, you know what? Here's the deal, man. I, 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 I need, what does it mean to give your life to Jesus? It's not signing on a thing. It means that you pray and this invisible God comes to live on the inside of you. That's what it means to have Jesus in your heart. It doesn't mean that you read some nice poem about Jesus and you just think about him all day long and you're just your fork. No, no, no. It goes way beyond that. Having Jesus in your heart means that you say, Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. I ask you to forgive me of every single thing that I've done that's shameful, that's wrong. It means that you're thanking him for what you already know has happened, and that is that he's alive. He's not dead. He's alive. You know it because you can feel it. That's what, that's what it means to give your life to Jesus. And then you say to him, you say, God, oh, great spirit of the universe come and live inside of me because that's been the purpose of God from the very beginning he doesn't live in buildings made of stone he doesn't live in the fire he doesn't live in he lives his desire to is to live inside of temples of flesh and that's what Jesus came for is there any one of you here say, Curtis, I, I, I've not experienced that. I want Jesus to come into my life. Wave your hand at me. 
I want to pray for you. Anybody? Okay. That's cool. Can we all stand? I usually not at a loss for words, but I don't know what to do now. Father, we worship you. We, we, we bless you. Send us out from this place, Lord. Let the greatest testimonies, let the greatest stories of renown start from now. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.